A frictionless piston cylinder device contains 10 pound mass of steam at 60 psi and 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat is now transferred to the steam until the temperature reaches 400 degrees Fahrenheit. If the mass is constant, determine the work done by the steam during the process. So I will draw this piston cylinder arrangement and recognize that if heat is transferred to the steam, that's going to be a Q in, a heat transfer in. That heat is transferred to the steam. And in order for the steam to remain at a constant pressure while receiving heat and increasing in temperature, the piston is going to have to move up. We are going to have to expand in this process. Think about it. As you heat up the steam and the molecules are moving faster, they're bumping against the walls a lot more, there is going to be a pressure increase associated with that increase in temperature. So in order for us to maintain a constant pressure, we are going to have to have the piston move up. Now again, we find ourselves in a situation where we deduce that via context clues. Now, I knew that this was an isobaric process because of the words frictionless piston cylinder device and this diagram that indicates the piston as floating on top of the substance. If the piston is floating on top of our substance and we have no friction, then the piston will provide the same weight across the same area the entire time. It can move up and down, but its weight is the same and its area is the same, therefore its pressure is the same. Those were the context clues that allow us to deduce that this is an isobaric process. So we have expansion from one to two. That's going to be a positive change in volume, and I'm going to have a boundary work associated with it. Since boundary work is defined as the integral of pressure with respect to volume, and my pressure is constant, this is going to become pressure times the integral of d volume from v1 to v2, which is just going to be pressure times v2 minus v1. Now I know that the steam is initially at 60 psi, and since it's an isobaric process, that means the pressure at the end of the process is also 60 psi. Therefore, the pressure that I'm going to multiply by in this equation is 60 psi. Now, do I know the volume? I don't. But I do know two independent intensive properties. And remember that it takes two independent intensive properties to fully define a state point. At state one, I know the pressure and the temperature. Those two independent intensive properties allow me to come up with any other intensive property that I need. Including, but not limited to, specific volume. Because remember, total volume is not intensive. And at state 2, I know P2 is equal to P1, which I know, and I know T2, therefore I could come up with whatever I want, including but not limited to V2. That specific volume can be determined knowing pressure and temperature. Now right now, in chapter 2, the only skill set that we have for determining a specific volume from a temperature and pressure would be to use the ideal gas law. But eventually, we will learn how to use the property lookup tables, and we will be able to look this up for steam given a temperature and pressure. But since we're still in chapter two, I have done that for you. In the bottom quarter of this example problem, we have the specific volume of steam at 60 PSI and 320 degrees Fahrenheit, and we have the specific volume of steam at 60 PSI and 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So we know V1 and V2. And again, that's just a stand-in for your eventual ability to look this up in the property tables. Whatever the case, we know specific volume 1 and we know specific volume 2. Therefore, I need to describe the total volume in terms of specific volume. Well, remember that specific volume is total volume divided by mass. Therefore, total volume could be represented as mass times specific volume. 
Therefore, I could write this as pressure times mass 2 times specific volume 2 minus mass 1 times specific volume 1. And I can reasonably assume that the same 10 pound mass of steam is present through the entire process. It's reasonable to assume that no steam leaks around our piston. So I'll write that as an assumption. Mass is constant, i.e. closed system. In which case, the mass can be factored out, and I have mass times pressure times little v2 minus little v1. I know both specific volumes because we, quote, looked them up, unquote. I know the mass, and I know the pressure. So I can compute an answer. So the boundary work is going to be 10 pound mass multiplied by 60 psi. By the way, I was just told 60 psi. Should we treat this as a gauge pressure or an absolute pressure? Well, the general rule of thumb is if you have no indication of it being a gauge pressure, then you should assume it's an absolute pressure. An example of the type of indication that you would see would be pressure is read off of a gauge all under and it says 60. In that case, we would call it gauge pressure. Or if we had the weight of the piston and we had taken divided by the area, that would be a gauge pressure because in that analysis, we aren't including atmospheric pressure. Whatever the case, though, let's assume it's an absolute pressure. You will commonly see this as 60 psi A to indicate absolute pressure and psi G to indicate gauge pressure. Anyway, 60 psi, and then I'm multiplying by the difference between 0 0.5216, 0 0.5216, and 0 0.4 something. I was. Wrong page. 0 0.4674. 4674. 4674. And that quantity was in cubic feet per... No, it's in cubic meters per kilogram. That's interesting. I mean, presumably we would have looked them up on the imperial tables instead of the metric tables, but you know what? This is an excellent opportunity for some practice at unit conversions in our calculations. And what unit did we want? Presumably BTUs, because everything else is... Nope. Kilojoules. That's fun. So, we have a mixture of imperial and metric units, and we are going to calculate a work in kilojoules. So I will start, as is good practice, with my destination and work backwards. Furthermore, I'm probably going to need more space, so I will spread out a little bit here. So a kilojoule is a thousand joules, and a joule is defined as a newton times a meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Now we don't necessarily have to go all the way back because we have a pound of force and a pound of mass here. So we could presumably leave this in newtons. And at that point, convert from pounds of force to newtons. Or you could break the pound of force apart into its pound mass components. It's entirely up to you. Since I have pounds of force already, I will leave it in newtons so that those force dimensions will cancel. Again, you're starting at a secondary dimension and you're working backwards and still, until stuff cancels. You don't necessarily have to go back all the way every time. So, joule cancels joules. My mass dimension will eventually cancel mass dimension. I will have two more meters that will appear once I break out the PSI into pounds of force per square inch. PSI is a pound of force per square inch. So length dimension in the numerator to the third power, and then we have meters and square inches in the denominator, which is still length times length times length. So those will cancel. And then again, the pound of force and the newton can be converted, and the kilogram and the pound of mass can be converted. So for that, we will go to our conversion factors sheet, and it says that a kilogram is 2.2046. Pounds of mass. That kilogram was in the denominator, so I want it in the numerator, and that was 
2.2046 pound mass. By the way, how did I know that it was a pound of mass? Because it's appearing under the mass and density. Also, your textbook uses just LB for pound mass and LBF for pound of force, so if it isn't labeled, it's a mass. Then we need inches to meters inverted, so I will say that a meter is 3.2808 feet. So one meter is 3.2808 feet, and then apparently I will change pages again. And then a feet is 12 inches, and I want my inches squared to be in the numerator. So I will actually come at that the opposite direction. One meter in the denominator, and then 3.2808 feet. And then one feet is 12 inches. And then I will square everything because I want to get rid of inches squared. So squared, 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 squared. So something went wrong with my screen capture there. I'm not exactly sure how much of that you missed. So I'm just going to jump all the way back to this step. And we'll walk through that one more time just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So. There were, our goal is to get inches squared in the numerator, which means feet has to be in the denominator, and then feet has to be in the numerator, and therefore meters has to be in the denominator. There are one meter in 3.2808 feet. And there is going to be 12 inches in each of those feet. And I square everything because I want to get rid of inches squared. One squared is boring, one squared is boring. Meter squared is going to cancel nothing yet. Oh yeah, cubic meters. Cubic meters is going to cancel square meters and meters, and then square feet cancels square feet. Inches squared cancels inches squared. So I got rid of those length dimensions. And then a kilogram cancels kilograms, pound of mass cancels pound of mass, so all I need is the conversion from pounds of force to newtons, for which I go back to my conversion sheet. I scroll on down to force, and under force I see that one newton is 0 0.22481 pounds of force, but I like to write the number that's bigger than one so I don't confuse my decimal places. So I will say one pound of force is 4.4482 newtons. One pound of force is 4.4482 newtons. One pound of force, 4.4482 newtons. And then the pound of force in PSI cancels the newtons and the newtons cancel the newtons. That leaves us with kilojoules. So calculator, if you would join us, we can compute a result. We have 10, actually I'll put that in parentheses, 10 times 60 times the quantity 0 0.5216 minus 0 0.4674 times 3.2808 squared times 12 squared times 4.4482 and then I'm dividing that entire quantity by 1000 times 2.2046 and then 1 squared and 1 squared and 1. Okay, so we get 101.7 kilojoules. So our boundary work is a positive quantity which implies expansion because remember that when we built our equation for boundary work, our dv term represents a positive change in volume. Therefore, a positive boundary work implies expansion. And that is going to be the work done by the system. So the system is applying the work. If it had been a compression process, that would be work done on the steam, not work done by the steam. That distinction is important, especially when we start bringing different terms together into the energy balance. For good measure, I like to call them inputs and outputs. Work done by the steam would be an output. Work done on the steam is an input. Therefore, map this somewhere in your brain. A positive boundary work is a work out. A negative boundary work is a work in. Got it? So this is a work out of 101.7 kilojoules, which sounds like a radio station.